Well, hello and um, welcome. Uh, welcome to the sixth episode in, in this series. Um, I can't believe it that we've been, this is our sixth episode. So after today, we have one more to go. Um, it's been an interesting um, conversation, so much to learn that we've learned, that we've gleaned from. Uh, and really the opportunity to also meet and connect with different practitioners um, from the continent. Um, welcome to People, Planet, and Performance uh, from the uh, from Africa to the world. My name is Taiwa Folabi. Uh, I am the host and the creator of the, of the series. I'm really um, dialing in today from <clears throat> the... Um, uh, territories of the Anishinaabe, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakoda, and the homeland of the Mischief Mistis Nations, um, where um, the Center for Social Language Theater, she said, one of the partners of these um, series um, is physically located at the University of Regina. Uh, special thanks to all our partners, HowlRound, for creating this platform for us to have this conversation. Uh, thanks to the Center for Sustainable Practices in the Arts, CSPA, and of course to the Center for Social Engaged Theater, which I mentioned earlier on, CSET, um, and to our theater partner, Theater Ministry International. Um, the past five episodes um, have been very diverse in terms of um, the thinking, um, the thought, and the experiences and the practices that, um, that have been shared with us. Um, a quick um, summary, uh, and I will try to do that quickly. We started the entire series, <clears throat> myself and Ali Akasam, where we were talking about environmental theater and climate justice in Africa. We were preoccupied with two questions. How did we get here? And how do we move forward? Uh, afterwards, um, Ogutu Muraya and Jehoshaphat Philip Saber, and I talked about echo theater, decolonizing the colonized narrative. And we were really interested in unveiling some of those decolonial practices or, in, or indigenous practices, thinking um, that are important to changing our mindset when it comes to issues of climate change. And, and, um, and planetary justice. In the third episode, we focused on retooling green tools for theater in Africa. We looked at insights from practitioners and we had Adam Maple and um, Harriet um, Adjaho. Ad and we were really talking about regenerative design, particularly how do we Think about design when it comes to performance, and 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 then we focused on different. Uh, uh, while we think globally, we said it's important for us to think, uh, to act locally, and of course individually, so that the interventions that we present as practitioners, designers, actors, directors, playwrights, and every person in the ecosystem can really respond to the local needs. Afterwards, we move on to talking about responses to climate crisis and emergencies, storytelling from the performing arts. We had Emma Blake Morsi and Anna Maria Nabria, and both of them um, really talked about their experiences, um, both in Uganda and Nigeria, and of course, as artists um, um, who um, artist in, in, in the diaspora. And, and what does that mean when it comes to issues of um, climate crises and emergencies. And of course, last week, the fifth episode, um, myself and um, Angelia uh, M01 talked about eco themes in climate action. Uh, specifically, we focused on what impact can the eco theme genre make in the journey towards climate justice in the global South. Angie, um, um, offered us some perspectives, particularly from their work, in terms of how they use this genre called eco theme to address critical issues when it comes to climate crisis and emergencies um, on the continent. I think something critical to, uh, to, to, to identify to, is the fact that 
throughout all this series, we've been carrying this idea of care that in the midst of the chaos and the fear that a climate crisis, climate change issues kind of you know, on earth in us, there's need for us to take care of ourselves. There is need for us to also know that the issues of climate change is not a new issue, is not also a Western idea that many cultures on the margins, many cultures, indigenous cultures have been dealing with this, particularly finding ways, nuanced ways to address some of these issues, even though it did not really come to the light until it becomes, uh, became a, you know, uh, an issue that the, the, the West deemed fit to take on. I, I would like that to sink a little bit because that's also important when we start thinking about, when we start thinking globally and when we start thinking about acting locally and personally. And um, the other thing that came out of all these conversations is the need for us to start um, being conscious and aware of existing practices, but also to ask ourselves, why are we doing things the way we're doing them? Um, who passed this down to us? Why was it passed down to us? What do we need to challenge? What do we need to unpack? What do we need to, um, to where do we need to step back? Where do we need to go forward? Where do we need to listen? And really asking ourselves all of those questions so that we can come up with solutions and interventions that are focused on our locality so that even though we're, we're trying to address and think about these climate crises, planetary emergencies, and all of that on this very global scale that we can start asking ourselves, where I am, what do I need to do? What can I do in my theater practice, in my dance, in my research, in, in, in governance, in finance, and all of that? How can I contribute my quarter to this conversation? Today, um, we have the privilege of talking um, to uh, Dr. Naomi Andrew Haruna, and, and they're going to introduce themselves. Um, um, and the focus of our conversation today is performance and climate finance um, or slash sustainability, but we're focusing on finance, capital and planetary justice. We want to address the elephant in the room. A lot of the times when we talk about climate change, uh, finance, we, we, we barely talk about the financial aspect of it. We barely talk about how capital drives these, these, this phenomenon, how, 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 how capital is so critical to solutions. Um, and I think that for us also on the continent, it's even more important um, whether capital is taken from us and then given back to us in terms of aid <laughs> or capital is taken from us in terms of human capital or wh whatever we want to think about capital. The reality is that finance is critical to this conversation. Um, and also for us in the performing arts, we also have to think about that, the role of capital, the role of finance in um, addressing this global issue. So um, I'm going to ask um, Naomi to introduce herself um, in a minute. Um, but I would like to say that um, I'm hoping that part of what we're going to be um, coming out of this conversation today is to have a different disposition to issue of capital and finance. Because a lot of the time as artists, it seems we're always, we want to push capital away. It's like, no, I don't want to talk about money. <laughs> but the reality is that it drives, it drives the world. Well, I'm not saying that's a good thing or that's a bad thing. I'm not saying there is no different way of thinking and engaging. But the reality is that capital drives these things, right? So um, anyway, I want, um, it, it, um, it's um, the area of work that Naomi has been doing. And so um, I'm really happy that we're going to be having Nami talk about 
all of this question, all of the questions that we have when it comes to climate change and finance and capital today. Uh, before I um, invite Naomi, I want to, a quick shout out to Flor um, Gomez, who has been our project manager and really the how this is the glue that bring they are the glue rather that bring us together so shout out to to floor um also to victor and tanya they've been with us for the past six episodes and i think today is the last time on our, uh, with us on this on this series so special thanks to them and i also want to say thank you to them because a lot of the time um the reality is that um, they occupy a space that is so critical when it comes to access and accessibility in this discourse. So thank you so much to Victor and to Tanya. And of course, to our live captioner, thank you so much. Without, with that, I will invite um, Naomi over to you to quickly introduce herself. And then that we're going to play a short video. And then we're on to asking uh, our questions. Over to you, Naomi. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your series. Um, yeah, my name is Naomi. I, I don't know if I'm to say I'm an activist, I'm a researcher, I'm, a, I'm an artist. Well, but they are all things that oppositions have found myself in within my career. So sometimes I am just strictly an artist um, who is trying to represent her work sometimes. Um, I'm an activist, and if you also look at it, so mostly an artist is an activist in, in their own way. And then I'm also a researcher in the sense that I am um, working within the university system, and I'm also the coordinator for a project that is being sponsored by the DAAD, which is a di um, German scholarship body, and we have... Um, partners, three partners, so University of Midugri, which is in Nigeria, University of Ghana, sorry, University of Cyprus, which is in Ghana, and then Hildesheim University in Germany. And our main focus is actually the SDGs, so Sustainable Development Goals, and rightfully where climate, fall, um, climate change also falls. Um, I'm happy that you spoke about capita in different um, formats before, uh, while you were introducing it, because really capita must not necessarily just be finance, you know, like money in its raw form, but we have um, knowledge as capita, you have experience, you know, and all these other things that make a lot of things sustainable in all of um, the daily struggles that we have to drive the planet forward and just see that the future generation has something really to fall back to or to use or has the opportunity to enjoy it like we do or we did, um, depending on how you look at it. Um, yes, I would be going between all these different aspects that I've mentioned and also you have mentioned. And um, I hope that um listeners would um try and just connect because there is no direct form to a certain thing like you can't be stringent i've learned um in these days especially when you're talking about um i don't know if you can hear me now yes we, we can still hear you and just to mention that um where dr haruna is it's raining and so um, rain tend to affect the um, the bandwidth of the internet, so um, they might be going off um, video back and forth, but we can hear you now, so please go ahead. Okay, perfect. Um, so I address myself as a she, her, what, um, and here, yeah, I would, um, I think, stop here when it comes to introduction. Great. Yeah. So I, I guess I guess let's start uh, with the video um, that you wanted to show us about the, some of the projects that you're doing. So maybe we can start with that, and then from there we will get onto um, get onto our, our discussion. So uh, if you want to play the video now, yeah, um, like I mentioned before, I work with a group of students um, who have who get funding from this particular scholarship body, which is the DAAD. I'm tired, please, at any time when you can't hear me, just say something. I will. We can okay. still hear you. Yes. 
Okay, so um, the video I'm about to play, I would like to mention that it's um, a collaborative effort between myself and the students when it comes to um, the storyline and all of that. So um, I have a background in theater and I also have a background in visual communication. Um, so yeah, let's just watch the video and then we'll talk about it hopefully later. I'm trying to share my screen now. Um, let me share. Yeah, okay. Got it? I think so. Um, I don't know if it's working though. Uh, not yet. We can we can't see anything yet. Uh, okay. Um, try it now. You should be able to share your screen now. Okay. Um, Is it possible? What's up till now? Uh, we can't still see it. Then I don't uh, know. What... Oh, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. Um... Um, I, I think Floyd is um offering some intervention in the chat. Okay, let me go there. This is what I use every time. I don't know what's going on. So press share screen. You should be able to do it. Get the green button. Yeah, I have. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe let's if if we <clears throat> maybe technology is doing us is um, showing us its its other side today. Um, we we can do this. Maybe we can also come back to it. I, I, hopefully, we can. I love to see the video because um, I love to see some of the work that you're doing in concrete terms. So let's hope that at some point, maybe maybe we can return back to it. But I wanted to start um, by asking the question: um, the two the two concepts that I want us to clarify which I started from the onset. There's the issue of fi climate finance and the, the issue of capital. And like we rightly said, there is social capital, there is knowledge as capital, relationship as capital, and all of those things. Uh, and of course, um, finance is strictly, is, is beyond, uh, fine, there's also the you know climate finance itself. I'd like you to just start from there in terms of how do you, for so, you know, what does, what does, what does these two ideas, what do they mean um, in relationship to, to climate issues? When you say climate finance, what does that mean? Um, and of course, um, in the context of capital, what does that also mean within the context of climate, um, climate, uh, climate, climate change issues? Um, simply put, is just finances that different big organizations put into a fund to help drive um, projects, activities um, that address climate change. So for both mitigation and adaptation purposes in all economic sectors, um, I think for me, that would be the simplest explanation. Yeah. Um, it's, ex it's, it's an important part of climate change practices, if we're going to talk about moving the ideology of climate change forward and seeing that it affects as much, um, or should I say, a lot of countries are on the same playing field as others. So now you have um, instances where organizations in the West um, put, not just in the West, but for this, um, for the purpose of this particular conversation, I'll just limit it to the West, put it in, um, should I say contribute towards um, a huge fund, which get distributed um, across different projects that attack the issues of climate change. I want to see um, different ways that we can actually help the climate, um, 
I want to say help the climate adjust to us and not us adjust to the to um to the climate. Why do I say that? Um, I really believe that the earth can survive somehow without humans. When you look at a lot of our practices, it is what harms the earth. I've not come in my limited knowledge, just to say that also limited knowledge, I've not come across um, practices or the earth sustaining itself where humans have been grossly affected. It has always been um, human actions on the earth harming the earth core, you know. So if you have people actively working towards reversing or changing attitudes and behaviors, then finance is important. Hmm. And then everyone's contribution also matters. So hence the finance towards the climate change. I'm going to challenge that a little bit. Yes, please. Many, many climate activists, such as um, Nemo Bassi, uh, you might have yes. read, have advocated against climate finance. Yes. And we're going to come to capital. Let's let's just do finance for now. They yes. argue that it is not the way forward towards achieving planetary justice. Mm -hmm. Part of part of part of the argument is the these where is these the the these monies plural are coming from these extractive ways of engaging with the earth, and yes. then we're taking this money, pumping it into you know, mitigation and all of those various strategies and approaches that we've created. And yeah. so it's like, we're deceiving ourselves. What's mm -hmm. your thought about that? Um, you know, I would also want to challenge myself and say, I agree sometimes um, on, on this particular argument that he brings out, because really, if you look at it, um, one part we are harming the, the the earth and then we're giving kind of money to ease our conscience hmm. sorry i maybe that's too brutally honest but i think that's that's just it so you're gaining profit out of something that is actually harmful and just to ease your conscience you give money and say okay go work on it and make sure it doesn't particularly harm too much or I would give money, just look for someone who can look for some sort of remedy towards actions that I am doing that is harmful mm -hmm. to the planet. You know, mm -hmm. so I would say that I do agree um, to what he's saying. One part of me agrees with that. Mm -hmm. And then another part of me would also say, um, but we are already here mm. and the harm has been done. Mm. So how do we correct it? Mm. Money is important to correct it. Interesting. So do we accept or do we then reject the money and say, okay, we are not going to reject it because it's, um, I don't want to use blood money in this sense, but like you get my drift, I think. Yeah, I, no, I, I hear what you're saying. And maybe a follow up to that question again, um, and we're going to come to what, what's what's the maybe to start thinking be, because I'm going to ask a question. What what's the implication of this for us in in the world of performance in theater in production mm -hmm. and all that? I'll come to that. Yeah. <clears throat> but before I ask that, I guess one of the questions that again you know thinking along this this this, this school of thought that we started on, um, mm -hmm. the fact that the this there is an extractive enterprise. Mm -hmm. uh, that in itself, you know, look at Congo DR, look at the different, um, look at Ghana, look at the, the various um, <clears throat> um, um, extractions happening on the continent. And yeah. those extractions, those activities are harmful to the, the, the earth itself. It's, it's harmful to the entire species even mm -hmm. whether human beings are non-human, you're non human species. Um, and, and, and look at, you know, the crude oil as an example. 
you know, yeah. in Nigeria, uh, which is which is where I, I'm from, um, mm-hmm. when the oil was discovered in Oloibri in 1959, I believe, or 19, I think it's 1959, if I get my history correctly. Um, and, and you need to go back to that particular place now. It's It's been depleted, literally. Mm-hmm. That, that entire place is is chaotic and and of course the Niger Delta region and and all of that and so I, I guess to to stretch Bassi's idea for the not just only Bassi's but a lot of other scholars who are thinking and researchers thinking you know in as who are activists and thinking in this direction what ways could could a total well first of all do you think a total ban on extract extractive enterprise is possible If it's possible, in in <laughs> what ways could could a total ban on extraction enterprise prevent further depletion of the environment, specifically on the continent of Africa? Now, if it's not possible, what yeah. what what would a new <clears throat> what what would a new um, vision look like, particularly in our relationship to finance? Mm-hmm. Um. Hmm, that's that's really deep because the truth is we're still in limbo. Would a total stoppage matter? Uh, like I said, again, we already exist as humans, mm-hmm. you know, and a lot of the things that are being extracted, I'm going to play the devil's advocate now. A lot of the things that are being extracted mm-hmm. are vital somehow to a certain point to human existence right this is just point one can we do without it i also want to say yes why how did we exist before they were extracted when you come to nigeria i want to use nigeria since i'm in nigeria presently and i am nigerian we've had recent um issues where um Mineral resources have been found in the far north. I don't know if you've heard about it, um, where it has been said that some part of the northeast is sitting and northwest is sitting on huge amounts of coal and more crude. So, but we exist in a country where we've already seen the effects of these particular extractions on the humans. These people do not have clean water in the places that you have mentioned. They do not have clean water. Sickness exists in the air that they breathe. They they have poor healthcare system. What kind of even healthcare would you provide to someone who continually exists within a space that has already been um, contaminated? So the air that you breathe continually has been contaminated. Even if you put a healthcare system in place to attend to them, I don't think that that's sustainable or that's a way forward because they still exist within the space. They're not going to leave that space. So it's basically, you just keep getting ill until the day you leave earth. Is that it? So we, we this is our current um, reality. Yet this is a country again, that wants to start extraction in other parts of the country. Why? Because of capital, because that's where the money is. And it is believed that they need the money for development. And then now you'd also ask what exactly is development? Because you have structures that the West has put in place that is considered development. And then you have us. Now questions of adaptation also, I would put it out there. Is it everything that we should swallow? Or are we also supposed to think about where the uniqueness of our own environment and what um, exists within our space? You know, a little bit further, another, I'm sorry, I'm just joined, putting, dropping certain points. No, no, that's out. fine. Let's go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So you have um, efforts that are also being made towards um, planting of trees. I think that's one of the most popular things now. Afforestation, yes. Exactly. But my question now goes to also the kinds of thing, uh, trees that are being planted. Some of them are not even... Um, are not viable with the soil that we have, but just because it was donated from an aid from a different 
country who believes, oh, this is best for you, or it would um, grow faster or whatever it is, it gets planted and then it just changes the soil formation. We've had that Plateau State is a huge example of that. I, I don't know if, yeah. And yeah. you've had you've had where a lot of the food that we were producing before has totally changed. The produce that the earth was bringing out of it that could last a long time, you know, in storage. We collected seedlings now that have been genetically modified from the West in the name of aid. And now a lot of this produce can't even stay up to quarter of the time that they would usually have stayed if we were using the seedlings that we were using before. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, it has so much adverse effect on the soil that we use to farm. On the trees that are even planted, you're asked to put in um, fertilizers. I don't know if you have fertilizers in the West, but then these fertilizers, before the practices that I knew my grandparents were using were just cow dung and um, animal feces mixed in with the soil. And then you have practices where this year crop rotation, I'm very sure you're also familiar with that. You know, there were practices that the earth has enjoyed and nourished from and given back with joy. And when I say the earth has given back with joy, it translates into the fruitfulness of the food that we get. Hmm. I don't know hmm. if that makes sense. It, it does. It does. Uh, uh, so it's it's interesting. I mean, a lot of questions to ask you. Um, because I my next question is, what should be our relationship to finance as artists? Having having all of this understanding, these these complexities, because it's complex, right? It's not the reality is not a one way thing. It's it's complex. Yeah. It's interwoven. It's messy. What should be our relationship to finance, that's one. In addition to that, when we think about justice, how does the idea of justice changes our relationship to finance when it comes to climate discourse? Hmm. Two questions in one. What should be our relationship to, 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 to finance as, um, as artists, right? Because we, we, the so what question is critical. Um, for us as performers, as a producer, as a director, as a playwright, as, as an executive director of, an, of a theater company <clears throat> and all yeah. of that. What should be our relationship um, to finance? But this, uh, that's one. The second thing is when we introduce the idea of justice, planetary justice, how, how can that change our relationship to finance? Um, I would I would like to start with the first question, then maybe I would ask you to repeat the second one again. So I think the first question I would ask as an artist, I used to be angry towards finance because when I get finance, something comes with it. You know, so sometimes I'm not even free as an artist to express exactly what it is that I want to because, because I have to also think about the person that I'm collecting that finance from, does it clash with their ideologies? Does it, but at the end of the day, does it also clash with my ideology and the things that I want to represent as an artist? Yes, so that is one. Then the second question is, but as an artist, I think we are the group of people in the world now, it might be, subjective, I don't know, but we are not properly financed. My project is one of its kind where artists, because most of our students are artists, get finance for the work that they do. You know, but how many of such projects exist? Everything is just towards the STEM. But people tend to forget that art is life. So do we shy away from it? I know the amount of work that I've been able to do due to this particular project that finances it. You know, I've been able to reach a lot of people. We've been able to produce this particular short film in, a, in different languages, actually, where um, people would listen to 
and understand using iconographic images that they relate with, not things from the West that they just do not get, but we've been able to contextualize our messages to suit our communities. That is true finance. That is because finance was available, readily available. So if we say, okay, we're not going to, um, we're going to shy away from that because it comes with um, strings attached. Really, mm, you know, so these are certain questions that I think I can't really give an answer to. Every individual artist has to make that particular decision for themselves. But in my own work, um, whenever I want to get funding or whenever I apply for something, I try as much as possible to look for um, institutions that align with some of my thoughts and some of my ideas that would also make me sleep well at night. I don't know if that also makes sense. And I'm not sure if I've answered you fully. If there, if you have questions, I can address that though. I will, I will follow up with the question of justice though. <laughs> if yeah. we think about planetary justice, right? Because this is the, it, it's always the idea that it, you know, it takes two to tango, right? It takes two to tango. If, yeah. if I realize that this money that is coming from this organization is coming from, <clears throat> you know, crude oil extraction, where mm -hmm. really it, it, uh, it has negative effects on the lives of people, life, people's livelihood and all of that. If I introduce the concept of planetary justice to that, mm -hmm. why keep collecting that money when I, when I know that most of all these monies, right, all these, all these organizations and corporations funding us, <clears throat> um, contributing to this port of resources, mm -hmm. they have, you know, um, to, to a certain degree, they, they have some, some, <clears throat> some issues on their hands. They, at times they have blood on their hands. Um, they've jeopardized the, you know, the realities and the, the livelihood of different people. If I introduce yeah. the planetary justice to it, mm -hmm. do I keep collecting that money? How does, what, what is just <clears throat> in all of that? in me again it, it's complex and it might just be a question for us to think about um and the reason i'm asking that is to pivot to the next thing around capital <clears throat> and i'm hoping yeah. that we can strike the idea of capital beyond <clears throat> excuse me beyond money <laughs> mm -hmm. a lot of um, the times and that's why I, I, we started from the eight from climate finance exactly. because when we think about capital in its holistic sense what are the other avenues, relationships, um, that um, uh, possibilities and opportunities that that can open artists into? So capital, like we rightly said from the beginning, not just only in terms of money, but in terms of social capital, in terms of knowledge, in terms of practices, in terms of the big idea of capital, how does that does change our relationship? to the issue of finance um and maybe i should make that you know more personal for you in your own work how do you see capital and how does your understanding of capital then um help you in your own in the various things that you're doing um i'm happy that you said it's it's um such a complex thing that um possibly we would just end up raising questions that maybe people would um, like to uh, ponder on because if I would, I would just like to talk about this personally. So I want to make that clear that this is just my own personal um, thoughts towards capital and towards um, planetary justice. I would not, I am actively um, in the SDG propagating institution. So when you're talking about um, climate change, you're talking about peace, justice, strong institutions, strong networks. That is exactly what I do. I have not, since I started scholarship, um, and that has been like for the past 25 years, even thought about applying to any institution that has any dealings to do with crude oil. Why? Because my people are suffering from it. So let me give you an exact example of what is, well, you're Nigerian, you know that already, but just for our audiences. 
you see the crude oil money that is being gotten, there is this Chevron scholarship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that you can imagine a company that has blood on his hands also giving scholarships to students to further their education abroad as some sort of corporate responsibility. Sorry. Exactly, corporate responsibility. But like, really, is that, would you say that's corporate responsibility? You're still doing it. You're still seeing the effects that it's having. So it's just easing your conscience and say, okay, we're giving some sort of scholarship to the indigents to just go. How many are you, how many lives are you affecting at the end of the day? A couple of hundred out of millions and millions of people. Will I collect money from it? No. Have I ever collected money from it? No. Personally, again, that's why I'm aligning with the DAAD because of their corporate action towards climate change. And then now to do your other question again, and I would contextualize it directly to the project that I'm doing. And you can see them giving scholarship to the indigents of West Africa to study this particular phenomenon, but study it in such a way that it would be contextualized to our region, not to the West, mm -hmm. but to our region where we bring up local solutions to tackle these particular problems. So will I keep collecting money from such an institution? Yes. Why? It allows me to do work that has effect on my community. It allows me reach my community. It allows me work with my community towards meaningful um, aspects of life that might be sustainable and would give quality life or whatever quality life that is attainable in this particular generation. So I would like you to repeat your second part of the question again. Sorry. Great. Well, no. <clears throat> um, um, and and thanks for thanks for bearing. You know for. For 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 being for being vulnerable to share your own deep sea text, yeah. um, because like I said, it's not it's it's not a one way answer. It is it is complex, right? It is <clears throat> it is very messy, and um, there is no one way answer. One is wrong, one is right. It's it's really uh, context driven, um, and and it's it, it's our reality. <clears throat> Uh, it, my second question was around bringing justice. I think you've sort of, you, you know, uh, again, because of our complexities, I, I, I will allow that question to just kind of, maybe it's just something for us to think about. You don't have to answer that. But I want to come back to the question of what does this mean? All of this conversation around finance and capital, um, <clears throat> now that we've sort of broadened the idea of capital beyond um, money, but that we're looking into relationships, so what we call social capital, we're looking into knowledge as capital, uh, we're, we're looking into different things, right? As capital, yeah. what does this mean for for artists? What does this mean for us in these in in when we think about performers, when we think about theater companies, when we think about um, a playwright, when we think about an actor? Uh, based on your work, and of course, I know you're like you rightly say you wear multiple hats. What does that What does that mean for you in your own world? Uh, maybe maybe even. Uh, for your students in the work that you're doing with them. Um, how does these understandings, these various perspectives, how do they affect us in our work um, as we think about climate issues uh, on the continent of Africa? Um, there is something that I would want to quickly say that has impacted me a lot in, in the space that I've existed. Uh, my dad used to say something and it goes like this, you need to sit at the table to make changes. Hmm. I don't know, as a Nigerian, I think maybe you've heard it in a different format from where you're coming from. Um, so I would answer you, but I just want to take you back a little bit. Um, capital, finance is important, hmm. you know, and as a young scholar, before I, I, I became who I am now, I'm going to be as honest as I can. And I hope that that would be appreciated because it's the truth. Yeah. And I feel like this is also the elephant in the room That's where right. we have to tell ourselves the truth. I mm -hmm. had to accept a lot of things just to get to where I am right now. Mm. So, so there were certain situations um, of finances or conditions that were given 
in my in my career that I didn't really like, but I accepted it as an early early scholar because I needed to be seated where I am now on a global table that my voice can be heard. So I think this also goes to me as an artist. Is that right? Maybe I've made certain mistakes and accepted certain conditions just to get funding to get to where I am. I'm not going to shy away from it. That is the reality that it is. Was it adverse? I always try to make decisions that would really not affect my ideologies and my principles. So that is something that each artist, each organization, each theater performer, each musician, whatever art form that you have, I think this is something that you also have to consider. We have a lot of brilliant people who have a lot of things to say, but they are not visible. Hmm. Why are they not visible? You know, so that is just by the way, this was something I felt that um, I should also add. Um, make decisions that you would be able to sleep well at night with, you know, but the truth is, unless you're sitting at the table where all decision makers are, unless you're part of the policy makers, even us as artists, we tend to shy away from all this concept. I don't know why, but I would like to use this opportunity to really talk about talk about it. We shouldn't shy away from being policy makers. Mm -hmm. An artist can be a policy maker. You know, we are all activists. What 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 do policies make? We we actively try to inform these policies to be what it's needed for our communities. So, um, interesting. Sorry, no. Sorry? Uh no, no, that, no. Thanks, thanks for your. Am, am I, am I having? I just want to. What I want to do is bring some of those key points together now, and then yeah. maybe ask you also a follow up question. Um, and thanks for 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 speaking your truth. Uh, and and it's the reality. Um, and it's your reality. Uh, and it's reality of many artists, particularly when they are come artists that are coming from marginalized. Um, <clears throat> um, communities, um, underserved communities that have to really, you know, push the border and thrive to be able to get to where they are. Um, it always boils, comes down to money. It always comes down to, to money, uh, not just only capital now, but money. Uh, As sorry, I can't count. hear you. I don't know if it's... Can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, you're back. Great. Yeah, I was saying that. Thank you for 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 speaking your truth because it's the reality uh, for a lot of artists who are studying <clears throat> um, emerging artists and even established artists. It always comes down to money, um, which yeah. is critical. But I think some of the couple of things that you've rightly mentioned is one context is critical. We have to yeah. think about our context, right? That's number one. Two is we have to also think about our context is our reality. Or to say it, uh, another way for me, I'll put it is to start thinking: What realities do we have right now, and what realities do we want to make to happen? Right. So, what what's our preferred reality? Right. Right. Because it it's the, it's it's um <clears throat> our reality right now. Maybe that we have to take some things to get to where we want to be. But when we get mm -hmm. to where we want to be, whatever that is, are we using our position and position not our position? to change that reality so that someone else does not have to go through what we've gone through. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's this is some of those key points and I'm and I'm hearing you speak. The other thing also to think about as you again came out of what you're saying is that we we need to get comfortable to think about um how messy this situation is. Um yeah. And, and we need to ask ourselves questions. We may not have answers to them, but hopefully by asking ourselves those questions, it can drive the choices and the decisions we are going to make. Am I going to collect money from this organization? Um, when I, you know, knowing their history and knowing the atrocities they are committing. And if I say yes, <clears throat> what to what the rationale? And what am I going to use that money for, right? Um, because there are some artists that, they don't have any choice. That's the only choice they have. At least that's the only choice they think they have, right? Um, or that's the only expose or idea that they have at that point in time. And maybe 10 years later, they will know differently, right? They have another alternative way of thinking and engaging about it. 
So, um, so that's something also I'm hearing. And I think that, which kind of connects to the fact that I think artists, we need to constantly do our homework of researching histories of the of organizations, of funders, um, to know, to help us um, in the choices that we make, um, to help us in our decisions. And then the follow-up to that is the piece around policymaking, that as artists, we need to start thinking critically, how can we um, engage in the world of policymaking? Now, I have to put a caveat, though. I know that in my my you know engagement with both artists and different organizations, whether from you know cultural diplomats and um, diplomatic commissions and different things like that, and artists, there's some artists that are not just interested in policy making; they just want to do their art and they're out of the place, right? But that should not say that we can't you know create a space for us to have a voice in policy making. Mm -hmm. So, and I think I'm hearing you say that, that we shouldn't preclude ourselves and say, no, I'm an artist and no, I'm not gonna put myself out there and all that, that we need to weigh these options and that that would hopefully help us um, to think carefully about how we set up our context, how we think about sustainability uh, and, and some of the critical questions that will end up driving our work. I'll give one example. Um, in Nigeria, um, Ola Rotimi wrote the play uh, of Onra Wenogbaisi. Uh, I believe it's Onra Wenogbaisi. It's a play text by Ola Rotimi. Uh, and then <clears throat> in literary discourse, they did realize that there were some um, discrepancies in the history as rendered by Ola Rotimi. And then mm -hmm. later on, some couple of years later, um, uh, of course, Professor Ola Rotimi, later on, Professor Ahmed Yerima wrote a counter of of Warren Obaisi titled The Trier of Ron uh, mm -hmm. And and history were told that you know Pro Professor Amin Yeruma was commissioned to to rewrite that. Um, and 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 of course we, we have both both peace right now. Why did I bring up this? Is that we need to constantly revisit history. History is not just only where we are, but what brought us here as artists, because that's going to inform ultimately the choices that we make. And I think that's where finance and capital becomes critical. What's the capital? Uh, does a capital of knowledge, for example, knowledge as capital, how can I drive, how can the knowledge as capital, how can it drive our choices of who funds us and who doesn't fund us? Yeah. All right. So um, I will leave it at that. I, I kind of feel like I'm bringing all of these things together. I hope that I'm not I'm not overtaking because it's, you know, it's a conversation with you. I, uh, if there are, I've not seen any question. Um, so uh, we have seven more minutes and I want us to, you know, um, to, to finish on time. But I want to ask you for another question that kind of kind of bringing things to, to wrapping things up. In your own work, what are the, what are some of the ideas that you pass on to your student or you discuss with your student in terms of how they steward finance? Uh, and, and, I'm, and I know I'm bringing the idea of stewardship to the very end of the conversation. And because it's very critical when we're talking about caregiving, caretaking, which are some of the ideas that we've been talking about in this uh, series, like I mentioned at the beginning, we've been talking about the idea of thinking globally and acting locally and personally, responsibility, accountability. There is no way we're going to talk about all of that when it comes to finance that we won't talk about stewardship, that we won't talk about knowing that whether you have fi whatever finance or funding that is given to you, how can you steward that? in a way that it's not just only useful for the earth, but also for the people. So what are some of those ideas, the perspectives that you share with your students or you discuss when it comes to stewarding finance? Um, first of all, I don't know if that would be, if you would understand it, if I say identity. Identity. Um, yeah. So one of the things, the first thing, actually, not just um, when it comes to stewardship, but in everything that we've also spoken with is know exactly who you are, what you are about, what you want to achieve, where you're coming from. So now stewardship, where you're coming from would determine how you would make use of whatever finances that you get. 
you know, I am coming from a place that has been ravished by insurgency, the Boko Haram insurgency. Um, I have been lucky to be one of the few that is alive, my students also, because we actively work. And we have made, taken decisions to give back to our immediate community, which means we have given the rules of stewardship to each and every one of us, you know? So how do you make use of finances that would not just affect you, but also the person that makes you who you are, which is your immediate community? So I always try to tell them to not get lost in the chatter. Mm. And try as much as possible to always remain present, to always know exactly what this hand, this hand has to be, um, has to be as open as it can to this hand. So transparency. Um, by transpar being transparent would help greatly in how you make use of your finances, even towards, um, especially towards justice systems um, that already exist, especially when it comes to navigating even through the concepts of stewardship. You know, um, I don't know if I've answered you well, but I think these are the things that we try to discuss. I don't really tell them, I always try to live in such a way that my students directly see what I'm doing and then we also work collaborations. Exactly. I've been, there was something you said, and I, okay, when you were talking about artists, I was, I wanted to tell you that um, another way that we can also keep ourselves relevant and also help ourselves as artists is to collaborate as much as possible. Because in collaborations, you take a little bit of the burden off your shoulder and you share it amongst a lot of people with like mindedness. That is another important thing when it comes to um, stewardship. Thank you so much. This is this this has been an interesting conversation. I mean, I can go on with you on and on because um, it's and it's it's clearly um, I, you know I'd really I'm really interested in all this all these um these um these, um all, yeah all this topic for sure. Um, I want to end on this note, which you rightly said around identity. I think it's a big piece that will be has kind of been the true line from the beginning. Is that we need to um, they need to constantly revisit and ask ourselves who we are, uh, who we are, uh, who we have become, who we are becoming, <laughs> um, and that's because a lot of the times um, who we are, you know, uh, many times it's it's not it's except we we deliberately you know go on a journey of discovery and inquiry to 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 ask ourselves to challenge the identity that has been passed down to us, particularly as, as our own, you know, from the continent, understanding the history of colonization and, and new colonization and globalization and everything that we're at right now. It can be hard to get silenced and to get subsumed into the identity of the other, which is not ours. And so it sounds like this is a beautiful place to end today to, Again, to come back to that idea that um, as we think about finance when it comes to climate change, as we think about capital, let's hopefully think about our identity and how that drive or can drive our choices, not just to the identity of who we are, or, but also the identity of who, who have we been? What has happened to us? Why am I where? Why am I the way I am right now? And also identity of who we are becoming. Then we can start turning down some things because I think there's some things we need to turn down. There's some monies that we need to turn down. Um, when we understand um, the, the implication, um, the histories behind the, the journey of how that money became to be. Yeah. Um, and there's some relationships that we need to start building um, mm -hmm. because like you rightly said, you know, um, partnership, collaboration, those things um, may not necessarily give us the money, but they can give us what we call in-kind contribution to what we're doing that can then create phenomenal, sustainable projects that everybody is happy 
and um and and um and and we're all advancing whatever that is with that i would say thank you so much to uh dr nami andrew haruna for taking the time to talk to us today uh she's doing a great work right there uh in maduguri and um leading interesting project um, in the university. And I hope that you and I can connect. Sounds like there are a lot of things that we could we could um, collaborate on. I'm happy to, happy to connect with you. A special thanks to Haran for the space uh, to have this conversation. Thanks to Center for Sustainable Practices in the Art uh, and the Center for Socially Engaged Theater and Theater Mission International. Uh, thanks to Tanya and Victor, our ASL interpreter, and to our live captioner. And of course, thanks to Flor. And then we look forward to having you next week for our final um, episode. And I will mention that the last episode is going to be between, um, I'm going to be having conversation with uh, Dr. Just give me a minute here to get to my note here. Um, with Dr. Henry Ajimese. We're going to be talking about performance and reconfiguring human and non-human species. We're preoccupied, we're going to be preoccupied with the question, how can eco-performance be a push for it, for the transvaluation of human and non-human species? And there's a lot of, so there's a lot of theoretical jargon in this title. When we come next, we will break it down. Um, uh, uh, and and uh, yeah, I try as much as possible to make it very non jargonry This is one of those ones that I, I didn't have a choice. So now, well, I had a choice, but I'm just looking like, wow, this, this is a lot of big words here. Anyways, um, I'm going to be having a great time with um, Dr. Henry Ajumis next week, which will be our final episode on this series. With that, thank you so much, everyone. And then um, thank you for being here. And um, I'm looking forward to having you all next week. Bye from uh, for now. And see you next week. Thank you. <laughs>